Well, there's two things we're going to do tonight, and neither one of them are my fault. Never mind. One of them, the lesson that we have, and I hope everybody has a handout. Did everybody get one or get to where you can share with one? Uh, of course, this goes along with what we're looking at in 1 Corinthians, and it's all about Judas partaking of the Lord's Supper. Uh, Dale asked me a question, I guess, was it last Sunday or last yeah. Wednesday? Uh, so it's his fault that the, what the lesson's about. The reason I'm sitting up here high and lifted up, it's Scott's fault. That's right. Because uh, Brother Scott wanted some of the Wednesday night services filmed, and, and uh, I hadn't figured out yet how to get them on the little, little podium, so uh, I'm up here so that we can film them. But I still want y'all to ask questions and talk just like it's a Wednesday night, okay? Don't, don't get intimidated just because I'm up here behind the pulpit. But uh, I enjoyed this so much. I hope you like handouts because this is a biggie, uh, five pages worth, and it goes pretty much in depth. But remember, we've been talking about the Lord's Supper, and mainly we've been talking about whether it's closed communion, close communion, or open communion. Let me just give you a review, and if you know this, just tune me out for a minute, but sometimes it takes repetition to get these things. Closed communion, C-L-O-S-E-D, just like closing a door. That's what we as Landmark Baptists believe in. Closed communion means only the members of the local church that is giving the supper can partake of the supper. That is closed communion. Then there is close communion, C-L-O-S-E. That is uh, a belief that uh, anyone of a church of like faith, uh, maybe, uh, and I'm trying to think of a denomination that does this, but anyway, uh, churches that believe alike, if someone's visiting from another church and they have the same beliefs, they can take the supper as well. That's C-L-O-S-E, communion. And then there's open communion, just like opening the door. And open communion basically says anybody can take. Uh, some churches will specify, well, you need to be saved, but some don't even say that. Some say whoever wants to take, take of the Lord's Supper. So those are the three. Now, there's two things I want us to look at, two things we've been looking at. One is two chapters in 1 Corinthians, chapter 5 and chapter 11, which gives the instructions on the Lord's Supper. In fact, if you want detailed instructions on the Lord's Supper, those are the only two chapters you're going to need to go to in the Bible. They're the only two chapters of the detailed instructions of the Lord's Supper. In fact, it's the only time the Lord's Supper is even talked about other than the Gospels. So we're going to look at those, and we're also going to look at Judas. Uh, I showed you all last week, according to Matthew and according to John, that Judas was not... Uh, a partaker of the Lord's Supper, that Jesus caused him to leave the upper room before the Lord's Supper had been taken. However, I want everybody to turn, or you can look on your page, at the bottom of the page down there, Luke chapter 22 is what we're going to be looking at. But before, before we read this text, and, and I, don't, I said turn because I like to open my Bible and look at the Bible instead of a piece of paper. Uh, before we read this Luke, I want to talk to you a little bit about what's on the first page of this handout. Number one, who all, this is a question, who all took part of the first Lord's Supper? Can we know who took part in the Last Supper? Yes, we can, right? We know exactly who was in that room. Now, let me ask you, did all the saved people on earth partake of the Last Supper? Did all the saved people in the local area Take the Lord's Supper. Did all of the saved people just in Jerusalem, just in that city, take of the Lord's Supper? Okay, how about all the saved and baptized people on earth? Did they take of the Lord's Supper? Well, surely then the saved and baptized people in Jerusalem in the local area were allowed to come and take the Lord's Supper. How about most, if not all, of Jesus' closest friends and family, were they even allowed to take the Lord's Supper? Where was Mary Magdalene? Where was Mary, his mother? Where was his brothers? 
Jude and James? Where was Lazarus? Were they even allowed to take the Lord's Supper? Now I want you to think about this, folks. People get offended today if you come to a landmark church and they say, no, you can't take the Lord's Supper. I want you to look who Jesus excluded from this meeting and from this ordinance. Isn't that interesting? We know at the beginning of this there were only 12, right? Plus Jesus. The Last Supper. I'm going to just read here, if you don't mind. I don't like reading stuff, but I put some stuff in here I want to make sure we cover tonight. You can either look at me or read along with me. The Last Supper, as it has come to have been called, took place the night before our Lord's death. Jesus had longed, long, long to eat the Passover meal with his disciples. And remember, that's what they started to do was the Passover meal. And it was the, that night it was going to take place. Uh, Luke chapter 22 records that, that he desired to have it. It would be a great help for you and me both if you go back and study about the Passover. Have you ever done any in-depth study about the Passover, what it is, uh, the elements that are used, what it's about? Somebody tell me real quick without going all the way over the Passover. When, did the Passover, when was the Passover uh, instituted? When did it begin? Moses, absolutely. The blood sprinkled over the door. Uh, we sang the song, When I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Uh, and of course, the Passover lamb is a symbol of who? 1 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us, Jesus, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Okay, So, God said, every year as a memorial, you are going to have the Passover meal. Let me tell you just a little bit about it. And uh, if you've heard this before, uh, it's still dramatic when you hear about it. I believe it was two weeks. I would have to go back and study. But I believe it was two weeks, 14 days, that the family would have to go out and pick a young lamb. It would have to be perfect. It would have to be without blemish. And it would be a young one. Uh, and ha they would have to bring it into the home. And they would bathe it and feed it and give it a little bed. wonder why God made them do that. wonder why God didn't just say pin it up out to the fence out there. They had to care for this thing as a family pet. How many of you have ever had a, a, a dog that you really, really cared for and it passed away? Uh, now, you know, you're not going to come to church and, and grieve like you would for a loved one, but on the inside it hurts, doesn't it? It hurts. Do you see why God would have them take this animal inside and live with it for two weeks? They wanted them to have a bond with it. Why? Because that was a picture of Jesus. They wanted to understand that it was something special for someone that had to stand in their place and give their life for them. So it was from this meal. And this meal had unleavened bread and some other things that went along with it. But it would do you good to go back and study the Passover meal. Not just the Passover when it was instituted, the night of Moses. I'm talking about through the years as they did it. Because this night, that is exactly what Jesus and the disciples were doing. They were doing the Passover, okay? Was Judas present during the Passover portion of the meal? Absolutely. Being one of the twelve, which was the first church... He was invited by Jesus himself to attend this special intimate dinner, being the Passover. Possibly, now this is my opinion, possibly as one last loving attempt by our Lord to show Judas just how much Jesus cared for him and what he was about to suffer for all sinners. For whatever reason, Judas was present and all four Gospels show that. Uh, do you believe that Jesus loved Judas? Do you believe that Jesus wanted Judas to be saved? The Bible says God wants all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So, there's no debate. Judas was in the upper room during the Passover meal and took part in a lot of the things of the Passover meal. He took part in the washing of the feet. A lot of those things he had a part of. And I'm going to show you how, oh, this is so neat. I saw something in this that I've never seen before and it's just it, it blows me away was Judas allowed to partake of the Lord's Supper this was even a more 
intimate time. In other words, after or toward the end of the Passover meal, this is where Jesus instituted what we call the Lord's Supper. This is where he took two items of the Passover. He didn't take the lamb. He didn't do any of that. He took the unleavened bread, and he took the cup, and he showed that what they represented, and he gave this ordinance for future churches to keep. Uh, so it was very intimate. Jesus instructed his first church about an ordinance to remember his great sacrifice, and it was to be kept by all his local churches until his return. In correctly answering the question, if Judas was present at the institution of this special ordinance, we must look at a harmony of the Gospels. Each Gospel records events from the writer's perspective. In other words, have you noticed how each of the Gospels record the same events, but they, I'm not saying they contradict, but they're different a little bit. They come from a different perspective. Why did God do that? Why do we have four Gospels? instead of just one? Why do we have four stories about accounts of Jesus instead of one? You know what I used to do as a police officer when I came, whether it was an accident or a shooting or whatever it was? I wouldn't just get one interview. You know how many interviews I'd get? As many as I could. And when you put all of them together, then you see the whole picture. Okay? That's what we have with the four Gospels. The shame of it is, most people don't use the Gospels that way. A lot of time we either have a favorite Gospel, or we're studying a section in a Gospel, and we don't even go back to see what the other Gospels say about it. You're going to get in trouble that way. Remember what I've told you before about getting one verse and holding passionately on one verse with a disregard to what the rest of the Bible says? You're going to run into a roadblock. I'm going to tell you right now, okay, the book of Luke, it's going to look like Judas is at and partakes of the Passover meal. If all we had was the book of Luke, we'd probably say, yep, he took the Passover. But you cannot do that without excluding all the others, because we already saw in Matthew and John, he didn't, okay? So be very careful about that as we go through. So, under inspiration, all four of these men gave us their unique perspective. And we're going to put them together tonight in this event, okay? It's only when we see all four. All right, now you can open your Bibles or look on your page at Luke 22, verse 13 through 24. And again, I said, this text, upon first glance, appears to have him, being Judas, partaking of the Lord's Supper, but... Remember, no two scriptures can contradict each other, so we must slow down and study to come to the correct understanding. And when you see this, it's going to be so cool. I want everybody smiling tonight because this is some neat stuff. Verse 13. And they went and found, as he had said, everybody with me, Luke 22 and 13. And they made ready, what are they doing? The Passover, okay? Okay. So they've, they found the upper room, they've gone up to the upper room, and they've set up the Passover. And it says, And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the... How many were there? Was Judas there? Yes, the twelve apostles were with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Why didn't they see what was about to happen? Uh, I, there's a lot of things to preach in here, and I'm going to try to stay on subject, okay? For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For so I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, The cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. <clears throat> but, verse 21. Now what's he just talked about? 
Sounds like he just instituted the Lord's Supper, did it? But the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. Now, is everybody with me so far? Is everybody seeing what I'm seeing? Verse 22. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. And there was, all, look at verse 24. There was also strife among them which of them should be accounted the greatest. <laughs> all right, y'all turn over to Matthew. I promise we're going to look at that some more. I want to see how smart y'all are. I want to see what you're already picking out. There was some words there that were very interesting in Luke. I hope you picked out. And there's also an order that's very interesting. Matthew 26. Or you can look at your paper. All this is on your paper in order. Your handout. Matthew 26 and verse 20. Now when the evening was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, that would be what? What are they eating? The Passover meal. He said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. Now I have to do a little uh, explaining about this. Uh, you'll hear the word sop. Y'all have heard that a lot in the gospel. Whoever dips the sop, okay? That is not part of the Lord's Supper. That's actually part of the Passover meal. Uh, the sop, they would have little bowls that would be full of either broth or gravy or dressing. And they would take the unleavened bread and they would use it almost like a chip or a spoon to get it and eat it, okay? Understand, is, is that any part of the Lord's Supper? Absolutely not. That's part of the Passover meal, okay? So Jesus says, I'm going to identify the one that is going to betray me. And what does he say? He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. In other words, uh, if you've ever been to a Mexican restaurant and you had your chip and both people went to get the sauce at the same time, there you go. That's what he's talking about, okay? That's an easy way for us to understand it now. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto him by the man of whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It has been good for that man if he had not even been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. Okay? If you're turning in your Bible, hold your hand there and turn to John 13. If not, just look on your page. This is what we looked at the other night. And again, this shows the exact order of the sop and what happens, okay? Verse 21 in John 13. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, being John. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him. In other words, Peter asked John that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. Uh, I, I love the, the humanity of all this. I, you can just see Peter going over there, John, John, ask him who it is. That's what's going on. Okay. <clears throat> He then, lying on Jesus' breast, said to him, Lord, who is it? John asked him, okay? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give sop. Now I want you to notice how John gives us a little insight that Matthew didn't. <clears throat> Hadn't you always wondered how nobody knew that it was Judas and Jesus has said all this stuff? It is a private conversation between Jesus and John who it is. Do y'all notice that in John? See, Matthew didn't give us that information. The book of John tells us that Peter whispers to John, ask him who it is. The Bible says right here that John is actually leaning on Jesus. I mean, they're ear to ear. And John says, who is it? 
And Jesus tells John, it's the one that's about to dip his hand into the sop with me. Now, do you see how all the other disciples didn't know who it was? Okay. See how looking at all the, uh, the Gospels help us just a little bit? He it is whom I shall give a sop. There's that same thing. When I have dipped it, and when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Uh, yes. Yes, sir. I'm getting kind of confused on which is the which is the Lord's Supper and which is the Passover. H hang with me, and you will. Right now, all we're seeing is the Passover. All of this is the Passover. The Lord, actually, believe it or not, even in Luke, the Passover has not happened yet. I'm going to show you all that. Right now, all we're doing, Brother Smith, I'm going to read all the Gospels, and then we're going to go back and I'm going to show you the, how it all connects together. Now, remember, the dipping of the sop was a part of the Passover, not a part of the Lord's Supper, right? So Jesus has now handed this sop over. John gives us a little more information. It's not just going at the same time. Jesus actually dips it and hands it to Judas, right? So now we know at least John, maybe Peter, knows who it is. Nobody else knows who it is. Uh, yes? If this was a private conversation between Jesus and John, then how did Matthew know that Jesus said that about the sop? How did Matthew know? You know Matthew wrote about the sop, but if that was just between John and Jesus, then how did Matthew hear about it? Who, who's helping Matthew write this? Never mind. <laughs> Inspiration of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> uh, how did Moses know what happened in the Garden of Eden right in Genesis? You know, yeah. Don't you love good answers? Yes. Was John a favorite? Oh, he was always there. He was there. He was, he was there. He was there. He was there. Yeah. 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 So many times. Yeah. 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 Was he a favorite of Jesus? It appears. Believe he refers himself as one of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying Jesus loved John over the others, okay? I'm saying John seems to be the one that was faithful and very, very, very close to Jesus. Wasn't John the youngest? He's younger than James, but you mean youngest of all the disciples? I would have to look and see, Kathy, I don't know. I don't say I don't know much, but I'm sorry, I don't know. Uh, he, I, he sure did outlive them all, absolutely. But now understand, understand the phrase, the one whom Jesus loved, Jesus didn't say that. And that's not recorded in any gospel other than John's gospel. And I believe that John did that as a matter of humility. To Instead of saying his name over and over and over, he just said the one who loved me. Make sense? Uh, you know, we were talking about this coming down. It's very hard uh, when you're reading. Uh, I don't know how many of y'all text on the phone. Without hearing inflection or seeing facial expressions, it's easy to take something wrong, something that was meant as nice or kind, and you take it as an insult. Uh, in my opinion, it's a humility thing that he's saying. I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, Keep naming myself. I don't want uh, uh, to put my name out there all the time. So he, do, he actually does not name himself at all in the gospel. Uh, you think about someone writing their own uh, biography. Was that an autobiography? Uh, and, uh, uh, it, it, you know, every third word, it's their name. I did this, and I did that, and I did... That's bragging. I, I honestly think John was doing just the opposite and saying... You know, Jesus loved me. I didn't deserve it, but Jesus loved me. That's, I'm just one that Jesus loved. But if that's not it, we'll find out farther along as we sang Sunday. Did I answer everybody's question on that one? <clears throat> okay. The reason this is important, back to what Brother Smith was saying about what are we doing, Lord's Supper or Passover. We know the sop is part of the Passover, Correct. Look at verse 27. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest do quickly. No man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. Again, it appears John's the only one that knew what happened, okay? 
No one knew why Jesus was saying go. For some of them thought because Judas had the bag, being the treasurer, that Jesus said unto him, go buy those things that we need. Look at verse 30. This is the important one. He then, having received the sop, went immediately. The sop is part of the Passover, not part of the Lord's Supper. And it says he immediately left when Jesus gave him that sop. Because as soon as he gave him that sop, the Bible says right here, Satan entered him, okay? <clears throat> now, go back to Matthew. Matthew 26. And Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, it is I. And he said unto him, Thou hast said. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread. This, Brother Smith, now is the Lord's Supper. Okay? Now, I've got all of these, and, and I, I don't want to get y'all confused. Do y'all mind holding your questions just for a minute until I read through the rest of Matthew and Mark? Because I promise I'm going to bring it home then, okay? I don't want to miss reading these to you, though, okay? Y'all hang on. Let's look at the rest of Matthew, and then we'll look at Mark. Jesus took bread. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it unto his disciples, and he said, Take, eat. This is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth for the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sang a hymn, and I put this just for y'all, the Hallelujah Psalms are Psalm 113 through Psalm 118, which is exactly what they sang. And uh, if you've been here at this church long enough, you know at the end of one of the Lord's Supper, we actually recite. We didn't sing it because I don't know the music, but we recited uh, some of those psalms. They went out unto the Mount of Olives. Okay, Mark. Mark chapter 14, verse 16 through 26. Uh, the last account of the Lord's Supper. And his disciples went forth and came into the city and found, as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. In the evening he cometh with the twelve. So again, Judas is there at the Passover. And as they sit and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, One of you which eateth the Passover meal, I put that in parentheses, One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they began to be sorrowful, and to say unto him, One by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? And he answered and said unto him, It is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish. Now again, we only have one explanation that there's only one person that heard that right okay but here's the answer and again we're back to that sop okay so we're back to the passover meal the son of man verse 21 indeed goeth as it is written of him but woe unto the man by whom the son of man is betrayed now what happened immediately after the sop according to john he went out, he went out. now look at verse 22 what's starting in verse 22 the lord's supper again right Okay, now here's your question. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read verse 22 through 26, but this is what I want you to be thinking. We have Matthew, we have John, and we have Mark that all put the Lord's Supper after the sop and after Judas has gone out. What in the world is Luke doing talking about the cup and the bread while Judas is sitting there with his hands on the table? Good, I'm about to show y'all, and it's great. Let me re finish reading Mark. Has anybody figured it out yet? Anybody? Y'all better smile when this goes. This is so good. <clears throat> uh, verse 22 in Mark. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until the day that I drink it new in the kingdom of heaven. You hear the repetition over and over in a lot of this. And when they had sung a hymn, again Psalm 113 through Psalm 118, they went out unto the Mount of Olives. Now, Gospels harmonized. Everybody now, if you were looking at your Bible, look at the page. Gospels harmonized. The book of Luke. I've got the main text right here in Luke, okay? Here's the questions. I've got three questions to answer from Luke, and I want you to look at the text. Number one, what does Jesus start with in the book of Luke? Does he start with the cup or with the bread? Y'all look there in the verses in Luke and tell me. 
And, the, and he took the cup and gave thanks. Does everybody see that? Okay, number two. Do you see him say eat or drink anywhere in Luke's text? He says divide it among yourselves. He says he gave it to them, but he does not say drink it, nor does he say eat it. Explanation. Look at this. This is great. And I would love to try this at the next Lord's Supper if y'all don't mind. Jesus took one large cup and he prayed, he blessed it, and he poured it into individual cups and gave it to each of the men. He also took the loaf of bread and he broke it in front of them and gave it to the individual men, okay? Now y'all hold on, this, this gets even better. Oh, wow, this is so good. <clears throat> Matthew, questions from Matthew, go down there. Number one, what does Jesus start with, the cup or the bread? Is that a contradiction? It's a different event, folks. One is the handing out, the other is the partaking of, okay? Number two question in Matthew, do you see him say eat or drink in this text? He says both. Notice verse 26. What does he say of the bread? Eat it. What does he say in verse 27 about the drink? Drink ye all of it. Okay, hold on to the last question. Don't read the last question. Turn to the last page and let's look at Mark. And let's see if Mark lines up with Matthew. Questions out of Mark. What does Jesus start with? The cup or the bread? The bread again, right? Okay, again, remember Luke started with the cup. Number two, do you see him say eat and drink in the text in Mark? Yes. yes. Now remember, both of those texts shows that Judas was gone, right? Now, go back to question number three on Matthew. This is great. Judas was allowed to see the poured out blood symbolic of course he was he was allowed to see jesus pour the cup okay and he was allowed to see jesus break the bread y'all if this isn't starting to give you chills you're not paying attention because my word it's giving me chills think about what's going on okay but he was not allowed to stay and partake of this special ordinance which was given only to true members of the local church in good standing. Ponder this. He was probably given a cup full of the fruit of the vine. He was probably holding it. He was probably given a piece of the broken bread, both symbolic of Jesus' blood and Jesus' body. He had it in his hands, but he wasn't allowed to eat it. He didn't eat it because Jesus told him to go. Now think about that in relation to Judas' life. Judas lived with Jesus every day. He saw his sinless life. He's going to see the sacrifice upon the cross, but he never took Jesus in by faith. Come on, y'all, is that not powerful? What Luke records with the cup and the bread, think about this. The Lord's Supper always starts with the bread. Amen? The Lord's Supper starts with the bread in John, in Mark, in Matthew. Also, if you turn to 1 Corinthians 11, it starts with the bread. Luke, it starts with a cup because it was not eating, it was not drinking. He was dividing it out. Go back to that Luke text one more time and let me show you. Luke chapter 22, verse 17. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and... Look what it says. Divide it among yourselves. What does all the other gospels say? 
Take it and drink it. Amen? Now look at verse 19. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it. And what did he do? He gave it to them. Now, there's one thing that I thought y'all might pick out, okay? Look at verse 20. Jesus didn't say this at this point in time because Luke even mentions it. He says, likewise, also the cup after the supper, saying this cup of the New Testament. In other words, uh, Luke says, after the Lord's Supper, that's what Jesus said, but not right here at this point. So in other words, uh, Judas didn't get to hear him say, this is the cup of the New Testament. Does everybody see that in verse 20? Isn't it neat when you start breaking down Scripture and seeing these details that, that bring everything together? So Judas was there when they divvied up the fruit of the vine. Judas was there when they broke the bread. What are those symbols of? What is that a picture of? It's a picture of the broken body and the shed blood. Now, what is drinking it and eating it a picture of? Faith. Faith. <clears throat> Judas got to see it poured and broke. But he didn't eat. Come on, y'all. Isn't that good? Now, do the Gospels harmonize? Do the Gospels contradict each other at all? That is some good, good stuff right there. <clears throat> Again, under the questions of Mark, look at number three. Again, remember that no scripture will ever contradict another scripture. The bread was the first element eaten, followed by the cup. Through Luke, we are given added information that Jesus allowed Judas to see the pouring and the breaking only, and maybe even to hold it but was not allowed to eat or drink, as is seen in the other three Gospels. Just like John was the only Gospel that gave us the inside information that John was the one that, that did the whispering, Luke is the only one that gives us the information that Judas actually got to see the Lord's Supper start. Think about it. The Lord's Supper started with Judas in the room, and Jesus made him get up and leave before they took it. Isn't that amazing? So, God's restrictions on the ones allowed to partake of His Supper. By the way, I say His Supper because it's the Lord's Supper. Amen? It's not the Christian Supper. It's not the church's Supper. It belongs to the Lord, and thus He's the only one who can dictate the rules. So, who is the Lord's Supper restricted to? Number one, you have to be saved. Amen? Number two, you have to be scripturally baptized. That means by proper authority of, of the true New Testament church. Number three, you have to be a fellowshipping. What do I mean by a fellowshipping member? Well, I'm on the church roll. I hadn't been there in three years. Fellowship means an active member. Amen. A fellowshipping member of the local church which is the one conducting the Lord's Supper. Number four, remember back to 1 Corinthians 11, you have to have self-judged yourself properly to be discerning the Lord's body and the sacrifice for your sins. If you don't examine yourself, you're taking of it unworthily. And then finally, number five, you have to be judged by the local church as worthy or in good standing. Now, I know this, this question has kind of been mulling over in your mind, and I want to give this to y'all quickly. You mean before the Lord's Supper, we've got to go through a church-wide judgment and say, you're worthy, you're not worthy, you're worthy? Listen, if you're here tonight and church discipline hasn't started on you, guess what? You are a member in good standing. Amen? What this is telling us to do, though, if there is discipline that needs to be done, you better do it before the Lord's Supper happens. Okay? So there are five restrictions there on who can take the Lord's Supper properly, according to God. So have you ever seen a church do that? Uh, 
there, there has been in the past. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not asking if the church has done discipline. I've seen that. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen a church you stop and go, mm, we don't need to do this because we need to take care of the discipline problem within the church? I, yes, not a discipline problem. I have seen churches do this. I have seen churches uh, say there are too there are too many divisions going on right now within the church, and to postpone the Lord's Supper. Now I have seen that. I've seen that, but I mean I've never seen them call anybody out and We're say. Pastor, mm -hmm. We actually have seen this. They You've have, seen it. They yeah. have happened at our church. What? They stopped the Lord's Supper for nine months. Very good. That and actually once that actually happened, they called but, a guy out mid and Very good. Aren't we responsible for our own? Self? We know what's wrong with us. Yes. That's the first thing. But the church has the responsibility to do the discipline if we will not Absolutely. if we will not judge ourselves. But we need to do ourselves because you know what you've got to talk about. Absolutely. But like but that's that's the point of the church. Remember, we're put together to help one another. Sometimes we're unwilling to judge ourselves. I mean, let's just let's just be honest. Many times we justify what we do uh, sometimes even in those op open sins y'all remember what was going on in the church of Corinth remember uh, somebody had their father's wife they were they, I guess they were married to him or living with him and they were coming to church together they were happy about it they were boasting about it that was kind of outwardly well that's what we're talking about that's what we're, we're talking about open sins I can't judge your heart No. we're talking about open we're talking about open public okay. sins. Open public sins. If there's two church members that are living together, okay? Say there's two church members that are living together and they're not married. Y'all just think about this, okay? When it comes time for the Lord's Supper, number one, they should look at themselves. Amen first? If they don't examine themselves, guess whose responsibility it falls on? Oh, we shouldn't say anything. We're going to offend them. Really? Really? Or is it our responsibility as a church? Come on, y'all tell me, yes or no, is it our responsibility as a church? Absolutely. Those public sins, it is. It absolutely is. When this happened when you were a little boy, victory went to a land. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was open like He mm -hmm. opened the liquor store. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mayor and father and members of this. Uh, you know, church, church discipline should happen with or without the Lord's Supper, but the Lord's Supper is a good time to remind us, hey, this needs to be done. Uh, that's, that's why we have chapter 5 and chapter 11. So y'all please look over those five restricted to again, saved, scripturally baptized, active member, self-judged, and then in good standing. And let's read the conclusion together. We're, can y'all believe we're already almost out of time? Yes. Can I make a statement and, and see if this makes it a little clear? Mm -hmm. uh, what we call the Lord's Supper was actually an event that took place at the close of the Passover meal. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it was the event itself, it was not the entire meal. Mm -hmm. It was the event of him breaking the bread and saying, you know. That's what he told us to right. continue right. in remembrance of him. Yeah. Not the whole Passover meal. Under conclusion, the argument about if Judas took of the Lord's Supper or not will probably rage on even when an honest examination of Scripture clearly shows he was not allowed to partake. In other words, you're going to keep hearing this question. You're going to keep hearing people argue about it anyway. Uh, even though uh, I hope, uh, and, and can I just say this? It's really hard in 30 or 40 minutes to show you everything that I've studied, but... I hope I've given you the concise enough to where you can see it. But anyway, it's probably going to rage on anyway. But look at this. Many try to use this passage in Luke to show that open or close communion is okay. Please do not fall for this trap. Listen to this, guys. Number one, even if Judas was allowed to partake, which we've already seen he wasn't, he was a member of the local church that was giving the Lord's Supper. That's close communion. Even if he did take, okay? Good grief. A little common sense. This would never give an excuse for someone outside of the church to come in and take of this special ordinance. Number two, 
1 Corinthians chapter 5 commands each church to judge its membership and not to eat with anyone who is openly going against God's word. This chapter clearly shows a church has no authority to do this to anyone outside the membership of their local church. Plus, a church could have no knowledge of the lifestyle of someone outside their membership. Both of these reasons show that closed communion, meaning only members of the local body can partake of the Lord's Supper, is the only way that we can fully obey God's commands given to us in 1 Corinthians 5 and in chapter 11. And it also lines up with what happened in the Gospels as well. <clears throat> Those who practice open communion uh, or those who practice close, close communion have no way of obeying God's commands in these, in these two senses, what we're saying here in chapter 11, chapter 5, and thus they have become disobedient in keeping his supper the way he intended it to be kept. Again, it is not our supper to change to fit our needs or our wants or our desires. It's God's supper and His alone. Do you believe that God takes it seriously if we change His supper at all? Oh, yeah. Does it please Him if we fail to follow His commands exactly? Let the church at Corinth stand as our sobering example. Look at these verses taken from 1 Corinthians 11. Do you despise the church of God? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. And finally, look there at 1 Corinthians 11 and 2. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me at all things, and you keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. The word keep there, if you want to write it in in your notes, means to guard them, protect them. We are to protect them just like God gave them to us. Please look at the last page. Not much left, and y'all have already seen it. This should be a pretty condensed uh, handout, and I hope you can keep it and use it in later lessons. Finally, a simple reminder of the six requirements for proper Lord's Supper. In other words, keeping it as it was delivered to us, okay? <clears throat> According to God's Word, there are six specifications. Number one, the elements. It is restricted to unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. We cannot substitute uh, Coke and vanilla wafers. It just won't work. Number two, place. It is restricted to a coming together of the local assembly. It doesn't have to be the church house, but it has to be a place that the church has agreed upon and we come together. You mean we can do it at someone's home? Yep, if that's what we vote and agree to do. We can do it outside in the yard? Yep, if that's what we vote to do. Time. There are no restrictions on how often or to even the time of day. You know, most people do it at night because the Lord's Supper was given at night. But does he ever command us, you must do this at night? <clears throat> we have in the book of Acts, again, I've told you under time, at the very beginning, some of the churches did it every time they met. Not just every Sunday, they did it every time they met. Many of them did it first thing in the morning. As we go through Acts, we see a little bit less of them doing it every time uh, that they meet. We see several meetings that they didn't partake of the Lord's Supper. Is it wrong to do it every time? Nope. Is it wrong to do it every other time? Nope. What is the specification that God gives us? As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Does he ever give us a command of when and how often to do it? Never does as often as you do it. Number four, motive. Obedience. In other words, it's not a means of obtaining grace. Boy, I'm going to get in good standing with God. I'm going to secure my salvation by taking this Lord's Supper. Nope. Nope. Lord's Supper and baptism the same way. Neither one is a means of obtaining grace. They are ordinances. 
Do it out of love and respect for the Lord. And listen, in a desire to have a close walk with Him. The Lord's Supper is a very special thing. Number five, the purpose. To show the Lord's death until He comes. It is to remind us or to put in the center of our mind His great sacrifice for our sins. Thus making us look at our own lives and hopefully making the changes necessary to be better servants and a better church. Each time the Lord's Supper is given, it should be a time of self-judgment, church judgment, and thus a personal and church-wide revival. I believe that. I honestly believe, y'all listen to me and see if you agree, I believe the Lord's Supper should be a greater spiritual revival than what we call a revival. Meaning a guest preacher coming in and preaching. I really believe it should. And finally, number six, the persons restricted to saved, scripturally baptized, fellowshipping members in good standing with the local church who is giving the supper.